I'm Jimmy Recor, and I want to thank you all for coming to Pre-Town Dessert Potluck. I, I'd like to start with a little humor by pointing out that as I look around the room, this is kind of like me being at Baker's store on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Because usually, for the first couple hours of the morning, I'm the youngest guy in the room for a while. And besides Michelle Harris screwing that up, I'm pretty much one of the young ones here. So. And Jason Silverman kills it. I'm just pointing out that you're the people that are interested in what's going on in town. And I think it, it shows a lot what your age is and how much you care. Because there, to me, there's a lot of young people who seem to care what's in town, but when it really comes down to trying to find out what's going on, they kind of don't make it. And that's, that's very sad if you're me. So thank you all for coming. And I've heard that eat lots of desserts is kind of a theme tonight. I don't know what Mary's plan is in getting I'm you to eat it all these things. You keep your hiding over there thinking you're getting away from it, it's but I'm evil. bringing it to you. So, we're going to talk about what we normally do here is you come in and you look at the articles that are on the wall and you put a check by ones you want to talk about. And what we usually do is start with the first three, and then if we have time after that, we'll talk about more. But it's just. We want, to, want you to go to town meeting a little more informed and prepared than just showing up with a warrant in your hand and not having any answers to anything until town meeting. Because if we don't, town meeting goes on for ever. <laughs> That's a good point. So article three, by the way, is uh, by far the best vote getter at 12. And it's to see if the town will vote to borrow 130000 for a design and engineering plan for a wastewater collection and disposal system, servicing approximately 30 homes in Conway's Village Center. That's the first one. That is by and large number one. Article number five is number, number two, and that's to see if a non-binding referendum whether the town would like to proceed at the May 2018 town meeting and ballot vote on borrowing for a highway garage. That's number two. So I think we'll just stop after one and two. And number one is up for dibs. Would anybody like to explain? Does anybody have a two minute explanation or overview of what this article is about? Which one? Joe Stragowski, uh, number three, article number three. And uh, I'm a track coach. How so once you start speaking, you get about two minutes. Two minutes. So, so be as round as you can, but give as much information okay. as you can. We got it? Can we start? All right, we sent you all a handout in the, with the annual report. Hopefully you got it. If not, there's two copies here. Um, what we've been working on, or, or what we're proposing, is uh, a low pressure collection system for the for 30 to 60 to 50 houses in the center of town. Um, this is not your traditional sewer. There, there won't be big eight-inch pipes. These are somewhere between two and four-inch pipes. They're put in with a ditch witch. They go down the street. You put a check valve at your house, and they continue down. We're proposing to go on to the Shelton Falls site, that Rose parcel, um, with a treatment plant. That was a place that the town looked at in 1970, 71. It didn't do anything that time, just for the record. But, um, so here we are, it's a million and a half dollars to do 30 to 50 homes. It's not a treatment plant for those people that live close by. It's a community leach field with pre-treatment. So what we're proposing is that we take the effluent from your, from your septic tank. There would be a filter installed in your tank. If your tank is good quality, they would use the existing tank. If it's, a, if it's an old tank, it's falling apart and the tank would have to be replaced. So you get a filter, possibly a pump, if you're, if you're downgrade from that parcel. And the, sewer, the clean effluent, the water, gets pumped to a pre-treatment facility. Most people call it a secondary treatment. And it would circulate the water. There's a couple of them in town already. 
Uh, Mark Silverman has one. It's a homeowner version. This would be more of a commercial version. It, it circulates the water, lets the bugs work on the water, cleans the water up, puts it out into the leach field, and it goes into the ground. And you have nice, clean groundwater, hopefully, and you're putting it back. You're recharging our aquifer, putting the groundwater back in the ground. We're not sending it to Boston or to, to the Long Island Sound. The water is put back in the ground. That seems to be the current thinking. You know, we've learned it. We just can't keep sending water away from town. So we're trying to put it back in the ground. Hopefully, it's being done in a better fashion than what we're currently doing. It. A lot of systems are in remediation. And when you, when you remediate a system, you don't necessarily have to follow all the same rules. It's about getting your home back in operation. You're not necessarily worried about the quality of the water you put in the ground. So one of our risks is contaminating our aquifer. It's very hard in rocky, you know, lead soil to predict that. On the Cape, they already know you can't take your drinking water and your sewer water from the same point. They already figured that out. They have local water supplies on the Cape and they have local septic systems and it's not working. They're getting all kind, having all kinds of problems. Boston is a little different. They take our water from Quabbin. So they're not contaminating their water supply. They're taking our water. So as a town, I think we have to worry about what, what are we potentially doing to our um, The other part of it, it started with economic development. I don't, I think if I took a poll, more than half the people in the town probably don't care about economic development. They like the downtown the way it is. Um, some people we've talked to, imply that if people don't fix their sewer systems, if they if houses get aban abandoned, then it becomes, I hate to use more blight, but you know, there, there could be houses that get into disrepair if people don't deal with it. I think similar things have happened in coal rain, they're struggling with the same kind of a problem. So here we are, and now it's about money, I guess. Is that, is that enough of an explanation about the system, or are there any questions on the system? Yeah. In this handout, you have some pictures from having visited a different system or an existing system. Existing system. Um, and there are these, uh, I guess it's the filtration systems that you can see a no, little bit on the surface. Right. They're about four feet in the ground. Um, just the top of it shows. They open it up and they can do... Uh, there's, there's several of these shown in this. Was that a much bigger system than that, what we're uh, getting? We would, uh, we would have two of those pods. That was two. for 165 homes. Okay, so there would be two pods. Homes. And how many pods are, were there in this one? I think seven in that seven. picture. Okay. So each, each picture of the flat thing is a pod? Um, there's a little... <laughs> we're standing near one of the pods. Oh, okay. There are seven of those pods that that's just And we would only need two? We would only need two. Possibly three if we were expanding the system. Oh. By the way, we stood there for, for those people who worry about odor. Michelle and I stood next to that for almost 45 minutes. And there was no distinct odor attached to it at all. Yeah. If, um, if septic systems, current tanks are found to be substandard, would the homeowner be responsible for paying for those, or would those also come out of the town? Uh, the town? Um, it's something that would have to be decided. It would have to be replaced. I mean, the other issue is we need 30 to 50 people to hook up, and we really think we need some town participation, money-wise, which is a hard sell. And then we have to go to a two-thirds vote uh, in a ballot election, so it's, it's a tough road. So we, we don't know if the homeowner would be responsible um, for replacing their own the, the challenge is we understand that if we want to apply for state funds or, or some kind of a grant, it has to be town-owned or at least a district-owned facility. So there's not money for a homeowner. We're not sure there's any money for the town either way. Most of the sewer grants have disappeared years ago. Um, I heard a rumor that it was Ronald Reagan that got rid of all those. He balanced the budget, <laughs> took away all the money for those kind of projects. Don't know if it's true, but Tom, did you have a question? <coughs> Anybody else on? <coughs> How much would it cost the homeowner to hook up? How much would it cost them to stay hooked up? And how many people do you have committed? I'll answer the last one first. We have nobody committed yet. 
the, the costs are in that cost sheet. Um, I don't know if you saw that. Um, the total project cost is like a million and a half dollars for the, for the whole system. And we have to figure out how to pay for it, obviously. Included in that is an allowance for some of these. So until we do the engineering and find out how many need to be replaced, we don't have exact numbers for that. So there's a, a budgeted amount in the proposal from time on to address these issues. I suspect if there's only two or three failed tanks, we would probably ask the homeowner to take care of those. And then everybody starts out with you know with a filter on their system. Maybe I wasn't clear, I'm sorry. We put the system in and I want to hook up. It's gonna cost me something to hook up. Forget I mean to assume my system is fine, it's just a question I need to hook into your system. How much is that gonna cost and how much is it gonna cost <coughs> me every year to stay on that system? Okay, we you're breaking it down, I guess, to a level of detail that we don't have yet. What, in my analysis, what we said is, if you hook up, it's going to cost you $800 a year, and that there's an allowance in here for the for the hookup. If it's a unique hookup, there probably would have to be an extra charge if there's something. So if it's just a normal um, turn the pipe around in your septic system tank and go off to the street, that's sort of included in this. It would be the unusual situation we would have to deal with. I don't think I directly answered your question, but I, I, we've rolled it all into the million and a half dollars. What, what time bond is telling is going to cost to do this. Program. So your anticipation is it wouldn't cost me anything to participate in this program until I was hooked up and it was functioning. Well, I, in the cost proposal, I had two approaches. One, if the bike goes by your house, well, three. If you're a citizen of the town, we're asking everybody to participate in a small way. And in this, in this proposal, which is one of many that we could do, I propose that we put 11 cents on the tax rate. So if you have, so that's for every 100,000, it's $11. So if you have a $200,000, <coughs> we're asking you to put in $22 a year. If you have a three hundred thousand dollar home, it's thirty three dollars. That would that amount of money spread out over the whole town would cover half the cost of doing this project, like eight hundred thousand dollars. So over the thirty year period, if we could all participate and put twenty or thirty dollars a year in, it'll cover half the cost of the system. The other half would be paid by the people that have the pipe either going by their house or that are connected. We need. 30 people minimum to connect or the numbers don't work. We can't build it. We can't spend a million and a half and let it sit there. We have to have a way to get people to hook up. So that's that's one of the challenges. Tom? Well, I've looked at what was said and I'm not sure that we aren't to some degree putting the, the, the horse before, the cart before the horse in the sense that we don't have really good numbers and I think our numbers could be better and I'm not sure that we want to spend a hundred and thirty thousand dollars for a design when we all kind of know what the design is going to look like at the end until we're committed as a, as a town to certain numbers for example I be I would vote in favor of a system where people who got the advantage of the system paid their fair share even if I had to chip in. A betterment tax means your property is better. And every, there's no question, but everyone in the center of town's property is going to increase at least $20,000 in value as a result of this because we all have to put in septic systems every 30 years and that's pretty much what we pay so if i had numbers where those people were paying twenty thousand dollars with interest over 30 years i'd vote for but i don't really i don't think i have that here i think these numbers people are paying basically maybe half of that um some of the numbers, some of the other numbers that you sent me, in fact, reflect that. Um, so, 
I'd have to feel comfortable, but if, but if people in the center of town were paying $20,000 each, and that's not $20,000 over the life of the loan, but $20,000 with 2.5% interest, which is what you're talking about, you know, when I run those numbers, it's $950 a year. And I see it being $650 a year. So excluding the user fee. So I see it being a lot less. So some proposals I'd be in favor of, others I wouldn't. I'm not sure that it makes sense to pay $130,000 until the town agrees on what the split is gonna be and what it's gonna cost assuming that 30 people go in. That's my how, how do you propose we get that in the Well, I think that as a town, we could at least do some sort of with particular numbers. We could say if people agree that people in the center of town should pay $20,000 each over the life of the loan, then you build a formula around that. I don't know what percentage they would end up paying. It's not 50%, it's probably closer to 70% of the project if you use those numbers. It's just hard, it's hard to, to get inspired about voting for $130,000 when we don't have any agreement on numbers or we don't have any sense that how many people are gonna, gonna do it. I mean, we can go camp door to door and try to talk to everybody and see, <coughs> are you committed to joining in the system if these are the numbers? And then we'd have some sense there might be 30 people. But I'm not sure we spend $130,000 if, like you say, you know, we have no idea how many people will want to join in. Mm -hmm. They all might like their systems that they've already paid for. Well, that doesn't work for you. I mean, we do have to, the Board of Health could, make a declaration that people had to hook up. Uh, obviously, we prefer not to do it that way. But I mean, in some towns, if the DP comes in, they're just going to declare a disaster area, and they'll say everybody has to hook up. We'd like to be at least sympathetic to people who've already spent fifty or $60,000. I mean, I don't want to pick on Mark Silverman. He said he spent $35,000. Uh, I've heard that someone else on Main Street spent $60,000. Like, I'd like to have some kind of sympathy for those people and at least have them wait 10 or 20 years to hook up if they've got an active system. But the other people that are you know, on old tanks, they probably need to hook up right away. We need, we need to get the income flowing as well. You're right, if nobody, if nobody wants to hook up, then we would have to force them to hook up in order to make this work. I just don't want the town spending the money for the design and then spending the money for a system and finding people aren't hooking up and all of a sudden the town's percentage will lose, and I think it's too. I think it's too high right now. We're, we're trying to keep this under 10,000 gallons a day, which means it stays with the local board of health. If we go over 10,000 gallons a day for a discharge, then we need a groundwater permit, and then we get involved with DP. We're trying to make the water as clean as DP would want it, but we're trying to do it without their help. So we're trying to stay under this 10,000 gallon a day threshold. This. Uh, this system that's proposed, is this going to exempt the people that are going to have the access to the system from Title V inspection, which is a huge, huge thing for anybody trying to sell their house? I don't know that I know the answer to that. What I, what I would say is if anybody had a system that was failing, I'm sure the Board of Health would make them hook up. That traditionally is what happens in a town. If, you're, if you don't hook up on the first round, if your tank system fails, you have to hook up. How's that going to work with Poland Road to the... Well, we're only, we're only talking about the center of town. Well, so those people will be exempt from Title V inspection and the rules that other people have to follow, correct? I think you're correct after they're hooked up. And once until they hook up, they're still under the same rule. But if they do hook up to this system, I'm not sure I understand. I thought Title V was just for a personal system. It didn't include a community but system. The town system, the, the leach field, will get checked. Part of this contract, there would be a, a company, a service company that would come in, and they would check your tank. If you had a pump, they would check your pump on, a, on at least an annual basis. Um, they would come in with a what's called. Spelled out. They would come in with a sludge judge, which tells them how much sludge is in your tank, and they would tell you if your tank has to be pumped. 
with many of these systems, they're going eight to 10 years before they have to pump the tanks. Some of that's included in this in the operational cost. You will then. Hi, Joe. Hi, Cindy. Um, <coughs> so my question is, in the reading it says you have two site selections. One of them is the town-owned parcel on Shelburne Falls Road. Could you speak to why that wouldn't automatically be the site selection and why there was another site also included okay. in that? The, the two sites is now old information. Originally, last year, we proposed two sites one on Jack Lockett's property and, and then the Rose Parcel. Mm -hmm. When we got involved with the new consultant at Time Bond, they thought that it would be too costly to develop two sites. So they're, what they're proposing in, is that we <coughs> open up one site and historically what has happened, the flows have been much slower than what, much lower than what the state requires. So then they've been able to add additional houses to the system. Uh, the system you have pictures of is in Hillsdale, New York. The state wanted them to design for 85,000 gallons a day. They convinced the state to let them design it for $42,000 a day. They started the system up and it's running and they're getting 18,000 gallons a day. So, you know, go from 84 to 18. So the thinking is, if we design it for 10, which is roughly 33 bedroom homes, that the flow will probably be significantly less and we can go back and say, look, we might add 10 or 15 more homes onto the system. But right now, you're only looking at Shelburne Falls Road site. That's, so that, we, yeah, we limit it to Shelburne Falls. Okay, thank you. Bruce? Two-part question. Do you have figures on the life expectancy of this system? And what are the mechanisms for taking care of the system being poisoned by somebody doing something foolish, which does happen. Um, the expected life is around 30 years, and then you might have to replace, you know, the leak, you might have to do some work to it. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about the poison. We have two, two members of our committee. Uh, one works in Greenfield, one works in Nashville, and, you know, wipes and, and all kinds of things are an issue. What we're proposing is a, I think it'll be a five or 10,000 gallon tank at the inlet. So any, you would have a filter in your tank, in your, in your septic tank, would keep any large debris from coming through the system. Chemical contamination of some kind, it, it would come into this holding tank and we would hopefully catch it at that point. It would be served as a protection device for the secondary treatments and the leach field. So somebody's monitoring this. It has to be monitored because that can happen in an instant. <coughs> I don't think we've discussed the details of the monitoring. We were going to monitor the site, whether we're going to monitor the pre-tank. I don't think that we've had that discussion yet. The whole site will be monitored. It'll actually have electronic monitoring, you know, back to a, an office somewhere for the system. But you're right. It, um, it is an education problem as well. You know, we have we have people in town that have lived on sewer systems, and so they think it's okay to put all kinds of stuff in. And this is going to be a leach field. So those of you that are on leach field know that some of these things cannot be done. So it, it will, will be an education problem as well. Try to keep these chemicals out. It will get diluted. I mean, if, if there's a 10,000 gallon tank, and that's one day, that's one a one day holding capacity, you know, you, if only one person did it, it would get diluted with the, with the water from the rest of the septic system. Oh, I, we talked on the phone a little bit, but I just wanted to be clear that I personally, I feel really strongly that the town field be protected for its air, potential agricultural value. Um, I know it's been in transition over the last few years, but I feel like, uh, yeah, I said it in other contexts before, but I feel like the, the bottom land in Conway is is a very valuable resource for the town, and it's very limited. So I think, um, you know, if we feel we're going there, or these um, pods, you call them, I would love for the field to be considered for its agricultural use, and if there's a way for them to coexist, um, that'd be my, my plea. How big is the footprint of one of the, of like this system? Um, we, I, I was telling Dave, I had this conversation with, um, 
Carl Nelkett and Carl's here. He was concerned about <coughs> raising crops on the leach on this leaching field. I, to be honest, was not something I had considered, and nobody at the meeting had an answer. They said there had been some work done out in Ohio somewhere that we might be able to refer to. But he was concerned about raising hay on a leach field and then feeding it to the cows and then we drink the milk or eat the meat kind of thing. I don't, you know, he was concerned about viruses. I really am not an expert on viruses. So um, I'm assuming it's okay to continue to raise hay crops or something on there, but I, you, you'd have to help me solve that question. Yeah. I know we put regular manure on these fields and that seems to be okay. Sue? So? Um, I think for this system, it's about 15,000 square feet, which is like a third of an acre. So the actual leaf field would be, a, let's say, a third to a half an acre. If that helps. That's like 150 by 200. Uh, that's a, an 11 acre site, but there's probably only five or six acres that are usable. You know, there's a lot of bordering vegetation that we'd have to stay away from. So it's probably going to be half of the available site at most, I would guess. And there would be the leach field under part of it. Joe, what's the cost, I'm sure you've looked into it, what's the cost of those those 30 or 40 homes homes with tight tanks? That's what they do around lakes. And where there's wetlands, they put a tight tank in and it's pumped out as needed. Um, Bob Baker would you know he's got one I think at the store. I don't know. Bob, how often do you have to pump that tank? Again, depends on usage. I mean, that's, I'm, you guys look at that, correct? We do it every once, between one and a half, two months. What's it costing these days? 600 some odd dollars, what? Per, per pump? Okay, we, we've run about 25 minutes on this one time. And, and it's completely up to you guys whether we continue or you want to go to the next one. So I need to hear from you right now. You want to keep talking about this? How many more questions are there? Well, I see a couple at least. <coughs> Two more questions. Three. <laughs> we'll do three more questions. How's that? Yeah. Okay. This is an important thing. All the way in the back. Uh, oh, did you have, Jim Does this have to have a uh, pass a perk test? Yeah. Yeah. Does the site does the system have to pass a perk test? The, the site that we're proposing? Yes. Yeah. And, it, and it does. Um, it's been tested in 72. It was tested again for the um, community, senior housing. And there's money in here to test it again. It also needs a uh, deep hole. They have to dig holes all the way down to the ledge and check the water flow. We, for a system of this size, they have to do what's called a mounding analysis. They have to figure out how much the water table will go up if you put 10,000 gallons of water a day into the ground. So it will it'll create a, if you will, a hump in the water table. And so then they still need four feet of cover above that. So they have to do this uh, ground, uh, mounding analysis, which is part of what some of this money is for. We, and so until we do that, we really can't give a firm price or cost for this system. We, you know, if we needed six feet of fill, it'd be sort of like senior housing. We won't do it. Just to address sort of what Tom said earlier, this is a two-stage contract. We're proposing to spend 16000 to get this information from the site, and then we, we would have an opportunity to stop and not spend any more if we didn't like the result. If it turned out we only needed to add a foot of fill, then we're probably okay. But if they said, oh, you've got to put four feet of it fill here, then that would be a different problem. Let's do that next. She's had her hand up a lot. All right. Um, possibly this question has already been answered, but I didn't, I didn't really get it. 30 homes are impacted in the center of town, my understanding well, of this. We're hoping to do 30 to 50 homes. Yeah, or 30 to 50. Start with 30, and then if, if, assuming the numbers come out low enough, we would ask for another 10 or 50. And has this committee that has been doing all of all of this information gathering, have they met with all of the people that are directly impacted to to know face to face what what it, 
what do these people feel about this? What is the buy-in um, with the people that are most affected? I don't, we have not met with each individual. We did try to do an income survey. We got about a 30 to 35% response. Um, there were opportunities to get grants if the household income is below a certain level. And we did do an attempt, we mailed, we did knock on some doors and we did some telephone calling, trying to get answers from people, you know, an income survey. Some people um, are not willing to share their income information for, for this purpose. So we weren't able to finish the survey. It's still open, but we haven't had enough participation. I guess my follow-up to that is that this is such a distinctly local issue that involves, mostly involves, say, 30 homes. I'm just going to pull that number because it's on the paperwork. So it seems to me, with all the work that's been done, that having a face-to-face -face or a community uh, meeting with those people that are directly impacted by this project and understanding clearly what their buy-in is, is essential before asking the community as a whole to put out for $130,000 here and, and half of a million dollars later and on and on and on it goes when the people most affected were not clear what their buy-in is on the project. My personal opinion. Mike Kirkland's last question. It's more of a common sense question. To me, it just doesn't make sense. We're talking about putting a leach field in a wetland area of a field that we just created as a, a storage location for high river water. To me, that's a disaster waiting to happen. Why would you do that? I mean, we're all here, to, we've got the South River Project trying to protect the water of the South River, which is great. I'm all in favor of that. Nobody wants to see their water tainted. But to put a septic system, which I believe is going to be way bigger than what you're thinking, right beyond where we just built a, for a better lack of words, a cesspool for when the water gets high in the river. That makes no sense at all. I'm Does anybody have any? That's not what the engineers are telling us. They're yeah. saying it's a good site. It's a site they recommend. I think it's the only site you have. Right now, that's probably, well, it's very convenient. It was done, as I told you earlier, it was the site they picked in 1971 to do 150 homes. Um, and it came back to the top of the pile this time. One of the things I think the town should do, I hate to say if you vote this article down, but the town needs to think about reserving some land to do these kinds of things. If, you, if you're saying that's not a good site, then the town better find another site. Because when and if this has to happen, we, we ended up going to, to the assessors and say, tell us which land is not in chapter or, or in APRs or CRs. Everything that we looked at was in an APR or CR. And with the pipeline, there's no way we would have ever got the citizens and the federal government, the state government to let us take a piece of CR land. But everything around the center of town is, is tied up in one way or another. It's the only available piece of land that we could identi identify at this point. But it was also a good site, you know, but you're right, it's, it's available and it's good, so. Okay, thank you. I mean, you, you faced a lot. <laughs> okay, number two is article number five. To see if a non-binding referendum, whether the town would like to proceed at the May 2018 town meeting and ballot Vote on borrowing for a highway garage. <coughs> Who's behind this and would like to speak to this? Bob Baker. <coughs> I'm the one that proposed this article with the Board of Selectmen. They got the backing on it, got the put on town meeting for it. In the last several years, we've had I've had a lot of people come to me and say, when are we going to get moving again on the highway garage? So I felt that a non-binding question would be a good way to get started uh, to look at this project again because as, as well as we all know, it's been three, four years or more. We had a lot of people say it the last time the reason they didn't vote for it 
was because they have they got internet access service in their homes. Why should they vote for Sun Highway Garage? So hopefully, for the Bob and his committee, we're going to be taking care of 98 or 99 percent of the of the internet access this summer. End of the summer, early fall, yeah. And I felt that, you know, I felt that uh, now would be appropriate time to look at it again. If you people, or the majority of people in town, are willing to look at this again. If you say no, we we'll come down meeting floor, then that's the that's way it'll be. But, but we want the consensus of the towns before we move forward again. Christian, you all know that when you go and look at a proposal like this again, there's some money cost to it. We're not going to deny that. Is this the same proposal that was voted down twice last year? No. No. Can you describe the difference to me? Because I thought we went to the table twice last year. Has it been two years? I thought it was last year twice. Boy. It's been three years, huh? No. Two or three years. No. Two years. No. More than one year. I'll split the difference with you. Maybe it's two. <laughs> okay. It's it. Time flies. Time flies. Yeah. Older. Exactly. Bob? All this is is to have a straw vote at town meeting. Do you want us to start working on the highway garage or not? Right. Yes or no? That's all it is. It's not a proposal. And that, you know what? What it ends up with is a different question. This is going to be just a straw vote. Are you guys interested in the town garage or not? Well, I, that, that, I understand what you're saying, but aren't we doing that every single year when we put uh, Article 4, we're putting $100,000 into the highway garage stabilization town. Here, so there's yeah. your strap hole. Exactly. Jim Moore? Here, here. Uh, do we have to start over with plans to draw up? new plans for this? That's a good question. I don't know how to answer that because I wasn't involved. I had a talk plans. with the deep. I was involved with plans last time, so I, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, because the state sets up these rules, and I had an argument with some of those uh, highway department people a few years ago. I cannot believe that every little town has to spend $180,000, $90,000 for plans every time they want to build a highway garage. And I and I, I said, why can't the state have five or six modifiable plans that we can borrow or rent? And he yeah, said, yeah. we can do that. The end of it. But it makes me angry that the state has set up that these that all our little towns have to spend a fortune just to find out something. I can add to that. Hold on. Uh, I believe which is to say that I don't know. <laughs> but I believe that the plans that we put together last time are the lowest cost plans for the site we had available and that is still available this time. So we could say, let's use the plans we developed at least as a starting point um, and that could save some money. The design money was um, less than the cost that we're required by the state to spend on hiring an owner's project manager who manages the project from the beginning to end uh, for the town because it will be more than a million and a half dollars. Uh, I believe that we could use the plans that we had before, which are, again, I believe the cheapest plans we're going to get that said, I don't think the plans are going, I don't think the project's going to be cheaper than it was last time because interest has gone up and the cost of materials has gone up a little bit and all, all costs have gone up a little bit. Mike? You, you did look at what Jim was talking about when I was on the committee with Ken. I called the state because it only made sense. Why do all the towns have to come up with this? Because it was 220000 wasn't it, Ken? Plans? He's not allowed to speak on this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was in that range. It was in that range. The ultimate authority. <laughs> it, it was a total of 200000 for the entire process. 
that was it wasn't just for the plans. There's more understand. to the process than the plans. I understand that. But what I was legitimately getting at, we tried to figure out if the state could come up, use us as their, their model, and come up with a highway garage plan to save us some money. And I reached out to them many, many times, and they didn't want to do it. So. Can I ask, uh, Joe, are we just proposing to bring the old question back to a vote? Or are we talking about starting old? What are we thinking? Oh, we got to look at it. we got to look at what all our options are. I mean, it's been sitting idle for three years, so. So are you saying in a way, because I, I hear what you're saying and I hear what the, the other you, people the have said. So are you cool. saying, do you you just want to take the temperature to see if there's interest in continuing Moving forward, forward with getting a right. highway garage in the future, not right. pushing what's been proposed in the past? Right. We're not we're proposing we're anything new beyond same. knowing if people want to keep working toward a highway garage. Is that what I'm getting? I'm looking at more. I want to know if there's any interest in it. And if I can say one more thing, is, um, I, as I've been expressing since the the previous votes, uh, yes, there, I think there were a number of reasons people voted against it before, and, and the reason Bob gave us uh, part of it. Um, I had hoped to put even more money away in the stabilization fund so that the amount of tax money would be less. It's a little hard to balance because costs go up every year. If we can continue to afford to put in $100,000 a year, well, in five years we'll have half a million dollars. How much will costs have gone up? We don't know at that point. So, in in one way, Bob's saying, fish or cut bait. <laughs> but um, th that's the reason why I had not been planning on doing it, and, and Bob took the initiative this time. Um, one of the messages I got was, make it cheaper for us. But that just means paying a little bit now, rather than having a garage and paying that later. So. Uh, I, I, I personally think if we put $100,000 a year aside toward this highway garage, we're never going to get one coming. You're never going to get Because what? the cost keeps going up on the other end. If the cost stayed the same, and we kept adding 100000 every year, sure we'd be getting closer and closer. But you, we all know what building costs do. Just do some work on your house. I mean, it's going up. Anything else? Chris? Yeah, what would it cost to privatize this public uh, works department? Is that in in our study? We're throwing a hundred thousand every year at the same issue. What what if you hire some outsider? You hire a contractor. You're our road department. Is it cheaper? Has it been looked at? We discussed it. Oh Christ, many years ago. But we couldn't come up with any hardcore fact dollars. Well, we just seem to be going like buckshot now in all directions. Uh, we keep wanting to, we're beating the same horse. We've discussed maybe just having, having at one time we discussed having just one supervisor and hire everything out. Mm -hmm. Like a town supervisor and then everything else we get hired out. That's, and, that's a uh, good idea. Roddy Sweet? Well, it probably isn't a good idea because then all the wages will be prevailing wage and instead of paying people $20 an hour, you're going to pay them 40 to $60 an hour. I don't see how that becomes a, a saving factor at all. And the material prices would end up being the same. Well, you have a building, uh, equipment, uh, a lot of stuff, but more than prevailing wage. And there's a lot of other things that you have to follow. Contractors have to follow a wood bidding, and um, you might not have the same person every every year or whatever when you have to go out the bid. So I don't know how it works City. with the highway, but in, um, I do know at my school there's some cafeteria issues. They had talked about hiring that out instead of having people hire for the cafeteria. And what happened was people would, the companies make offers that are real low, and it looks really good. You can even get five, six years out of them, and then all of a sudden you have no control over that when now you have no bookkeeping around for it, and you have no people around for it, and the system is totally dependent on them. Then all of a sudden things change, and as, when, I think the main thing that I just heard was you don't know what you're getting. You know, you may get somebody who's a real go-getter worker, and you may get somebody who's in there for the forty dollars an hour. 
So I, I'm totally against that because I think what we have are really good people on our department. I just think that they need a new house. But, yeah. Tom Lesser. I just want to say I second what Cindy just said. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that means a lot. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> wow. Good Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Okay, now the next uh, next discussion, uh, there was a tie for the third. And the first one was uh, Article 4, which is to see if the town will raise and appropriate transfer of available funds or otherwise provide a hundred thousand for the highway garage stabilization account that's pretty congruent to what we talked about the other one is uh whoop, i missed it article 18. <laughs> article 18 is to see if the town will appropriate appropriate or to reserve for later appropriation monies from the community preservation fund as recommended by the Community Preservation Committee is set forth herein. Okay. Now, a show of hands. Do you want to talk about Article 4 or Article 18? Is, uh, Jim, can I clarify that Article 18 that is a real spending, well, one spending proposal right there that we, yeah. is um, item A, 18A. 18A. Okay. Okay. So, what is 18A? You got to do one and then the other. Appropriations 18A to appropriate $9,200 from the Community Preservation Open Space Reserve to the Town of Conway Open Space Committee for purposes of enabling a three year invasive spe uh, species control program on 11 acres of town owned land on Shelburne Falls Road, AKA South River Meadow. That's beautiful. The program is to include a combination of cutting and herbicide treatment. Who wants to talk about that? Or Article 4? Okay, let's go with 18A first. Okay, thank you. The Open Space Committee has looked at it in conjunction with the, the floodplain restoration project and the work that went on there. We've been looking at most at the perimeters of that property. Um, the Friends of the South River private group of people had tried for years to cut back on the invasive plants that are inundating the edges. Uh, we, we do have a map up there. Maybe you can take a look at on the on the outside. If those of you who haven't seen or tried to walk around there just on the edges along the river and it's town owned, you can hardly get to the river because of mostly the Japanese knotweed and a host of other um, plants that are, are, are um, suffocating the native plants that could be there. We hired um, contracted with Lori Sanders, a naturalist who is here uh, with me. Uh, to review the property, as, as, and she did a fabulous job. It's been up on the website. We had a special forum about it. It's, the information is still available. She assesses the history and the prospects for the future, um, which are uh, have a lot of recreation possibilities, learning and teaching. And what we're concerned with really is just the perimeters of this property. So whatever else happens, whether it was going to be housing, uh, a project or now in, in agriculture in the middle and the Leachfield town system. Um, that's fine and, and our proposals will coexist and, and ultimately make it just a nicer place to be and, and be something that the town can be proud of. Um, and we that can demonstrate that we can do something positive for nature to reclaim some of the degradation that's occurred over time. And it happens in a lot of disturbed Habitat. So we would. Uh, this money would pay for three years of professional herbicide licensed person uh, selected by bid, who is licensed as an applicator um, by the state. It's a rigorous, rigorous test to the licenses that have to be maintained. 
using only herbicides found on the Massachusetts sensitive area <coughs> materials list. Um, and done when the bees are not active and done when there's no wind and done with posting and done with notification <coughs> to neighbors and within a day people will be easily back there walking their um, dogs and getting down to the river. Um, the, uh, um, there'll be a, it's a combination of cutting stems and very specific applications on the stems. There are many of these plants that are sweet that just you just keep cutting it, it spreads and spreads. Um, so that's that's the proposal. Lori Sanders, can I call the questions in it? And yeah, um, I would say I've got a reasonable amount of experience with invasives. And if you control it for three years, not weed, it'll be back. Unless you've taken care of it in every <coughs> possible perimeter. <coughs> Bittersweet will remain active in the ground seeds for well over 50 years. We, uh, we propose the three years, and the hope is that perhaps 90% of the touches will, will be knocked out. We, we understand there is ongoing maintenance, but we also mm -hmm. understand that when the, the, those seeds that then come back up are very small, and we've been told we can pull them in their first year of life, uh, perhaps. It, it still, I mean, the problem will not be over. It's an no. ongoing. And I'm going to ask Lori to stand up now and help me answer some of these questions. Just point of order. Oh, Lori's Lord not from town. I'm a so we got to have a vote here. Can she speak or is it tire and feathers? This is a free town. Free town meeting. She can speak. Free town. So on the tire and feathers thing, Malcolm, you can go first. Yeah, I've got it. I thought. Being on that committee, I thought there was nine thousand dollars left over from last year's proposal that they didn't use. I that didn't was, think it was going to go this route. I, I must have been asleep today. Oh, that was that was for the stilt grass removal, <laughs> which is a different species. It's a different plant, different um, part and, and in different sections of town. So this was a separate vote that the CPA. Do we know how effective this. Is? Like the gentleman said over there, nobody's saying who they are, so I can't tell who's talking. But uh, everybody there. knows me, so I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll respond to your question. So you you can um, not these non-native plants. Uh, it is an ongoing issue. It's not eradication. It's really control and long-term maintenance. The way that the reason the three year term is proposed is literally if you go in once, you're, you're not going to be effective. And, but what uh, a number of applicators in not only you know, uh, here in Massachusetts, but in a much more widespread uh, way, are looking at these three year protocols. The first year, there is a major reduction. And then the second year and third year. And it's, it's pretty dramatic. But absolutely, go sleep at the switch. No one, five years later, it's going to be back because there's a tremendous amount of seed source, not only present right now on site, but coming in. And then we really saw it here in Conway and many other communities in Franklin County after, uh, after Irene, where especially with the rootstocks of Japanese knotweed, which is the one of the principal uh, species there that now what's happened is not it's not only a habitat issue in terms of a sort of general biodiversity but i would say for those of you who know the site and have walked there there's just like on a purely aesthetic you we cannot see the river in big sections and furthermore there's also just the kind of the, the recreation aspect in terms of river access and yes there's habitat issues and other, other other benefits, but this three-year protocol has been used pretty effectively at many other sites here in New England. But but then it keeps going, and hopefully there will be you know more people who will be invested. But as a initially, you can't simply use mechanical treatment, uh, 
in, in, a, in an effective way. It's, it's a big problem. It's an issue. It's an important issue. Other questions? No. Yeah. I had my property marked for logging last year. Yeah. And when the forester was out there marking the, the woods, he found a bunch of heavy Yeah. And he gave me all kinds of paperwork that I can go to the state for a state oh. grant. So they'll come in and uh, treat it or whatever they do. I know that you guys are passionate about this, not weed or other species. Is there any state grants for this? It just doesn't seem like the reason that people are putting into the CPA plan. Well, but, could you, but with the CPA, it's uh, open space protection, it's education, it's recreation, and these are some of the elements that will be enhanced with this uh, project. Um, but I'm not aware right now of any NRCS money or other monies available. Um, but there's a big economic impact when you have bittersweet curling up your trees timber value really, really tanks. Yeah. Uh, Mike, those, so those programs now are mostly for private landowners. We are continuing, the committee is actively exploring, and because there is some other town property that we can get some of the center control, where uh, Melissa, uh, several members of our committee are here, are actively working to see for the future if we can tap into some of those monies. But a lot of them are for um, private, as far as we know. Um, I am all for controlling invasive species, and I'm certainly all for promoting the biodiversity of the native plants along the river. Um, but I do have to say, I'm, I am pretty concerned with the idea of regular application of herbicide right along the river. Um, you know, we're just a little ways downstream. We use that water for irrigating our organic crops. We use that water for watering our livestock. Um, I understand you're talking about using licensed applicators and being very careful. Um, so I'm not sure that I would say I'm, you know, steadfastly opposed, but I would love to be thoroughly reassured that there isn't going to be any, you know, any leaching contamination, contamination over spray or whatever that is going to come our way down the river. Well, two, two of the two of the uh, uh, companies that, that the committee has investigated, they've worked uh, widely in with other conservation land, and uh, these. I think one of the things that um, is, is important to, to both of the uh, companies that, have, or one of the companies, uh, Chris uh, Colleton, who's worked here in Conway already, in Bay State Forestry, that, that the CPC worked with for this proposal, is um, it's, it's, it's targeted not only in terms of when things are leafing out so that you can hit those uh, with the, the correct herbicide for the project and um, and then and then a cut and heat treatment. So it's super targeted. And I think, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not an advocate for herbicides. Absolutely not. Uh, but in certain select uh, settings they are an appropriate tool. And you see this in the Nature Conservancy in Mass Audubon has turned around, you know, but it would be I, I, I'm empathetic with, with your issues, and I think you, I think that's one of the things that's nice with the, the teams that uh, may be hired. They would welcome you to attend that pre-site meeting, so that those concerns could be they are addressed. On the materials on this safe list that are the only ones that can be used are selected for their low toxicity, low tendency for off site movement and rapid biological composition. So that's um, So would this be like uh, with the Japanese knotweed, would it be injecting directly into the main stem of those plants like like you were showing us to had that tour? That's one treatment. The the treatment that's that was used last year as part of the uh, flood mitigation and uh, creation of flood storage. Um, that was a spray application that occurred later in the year, and I think my, my understanding with, with this one is that it would be a spray application, and generally that happens after June, after the, you know, most of the growth is going up, and so you, you hit it once it's, it's higher, and basically at, at that point, 
I mean, potentially you could work with the app, uh, the uh, licensed applicator to see, well, maybe along the perimeter you could do something so that you, you, you didn't have an impact on the margins. But the, the concentration of, of Japanese knotweed in some of those areas is, is uh, that's it. So that's basically the only thing that's going. The folks that we've talked to, they all want to use the least amount of chemical possible. That's the most effective. Um, and they have a lot of experience. So, I mean, one of the, we know what they're going to be using and when and how they're going to use it, but we can't, you know, tell them this method and not that method because they know and have the experience and, and all the other also Audubon. You know, I mean, Jim Moore. Okay. Yep. Uh, two things. Um, <coughs> is, is this herbicide going to kill any of the other plants that are adjacent to that? that might be beneficial to us. Um, and if we just do it there, if you go around town, there are thousands of acres of this stuff. And I don't know that much about it, and I don't know how it spreads, but it, it seems like some of it's through the roots and it keeps coming up. And I just pull it up in my yard, it comes right out of the ground, uh, but I can't pull up all of it along the river. Um, yeah, well, but if you're talking it, about Japanese knotweed, uh, mechanical removal is not an effective treatment method at all because all you need is the sort of the last <laughs> digit of my thumb, and that's all you need to have either start a new population or remain in the soil and it will uh, return. So, well, so, 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 it's going to return anyway. Well, well, it is, and I, I guess the the thing with invasive species. Uh, invasive plant species is you have to be really thoughtful in terms of where do you want to make the investment. It's a cost. I don't dispute that. But since this is a site that has the possibility of, uh, is already being used by town residents, has the capacity to be used more uh, by, uh, by other folks, you know, this, this may be a site where it, it is worth making that investment and you know, once you once you can do that at first, then it gets easier. But it's ev it's it's forever. It, it, we're hoping that, that this will become a demonstration project, and that then we can, can see if you want to use some of these tools on on your section and on your own property, and then you get together. Uh, but well, we want to see the results. But what is the, I live I live right there, and. We talked about recreation and people getting to the river. I have never seen knotweed or anything else keep people from going down to the river and enjoying the river. Uh, yeah, but they can't park there. No. Well, there, 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 there are two they access paths. There, that's okay. There are two access paths right now. But what, what, what you are prevented is, is you walk along there, you, you can't see the river in a big, big section because of that. And furthermore, it's not only about us. I mean, there's also all kinds of the, the diversity of habitat is uh, much less, and so the wildlife value is much less. If, if you're just thinking about Japanese knotweed, it, it has a much lower uh, value for a diversity of pollinators. So if you can get rid of that and you can get more species coming in, you know, there's, there's multiple, multiple benefits, um, and recreation is one thing. This fellow's first. Yeah. You know, it's probably too late for the 250th, but I mean, there is poison ivy on every roadside. I mean, you can't walk, you can't go take a leak in the woods next to the road. I mean, there's just, you can't go around. Yeah, but it's poison ivy. And you know, if we're going to get rid of a, of a species, I mean, that would be my choice. It's <laughs> native. would be the point. Right, it's native. Prisoners, stuff out. The prisoners. Uh, <laughs> you have to have a license application in order to. You have to have a uh, license. You have to be a licensed applicator uh, in order, and then and then you can sue. Huh? But I, I don't. I, I don't. I think there are new uh, worker rules uh, with, with prisoners. Okay. So. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. I didn't really want to pull a plug so abruptly, but...
<laughs> Cindy Womet, once again, as she has so many times in my life before, pointed out to me that I've missed something. He's and asking. normally, it's Not true. Here. It's true. At the beginning of these meetings, we let anybody running for office get up and say a little something about themselves and why they're running. And so I want to allow time for that now. So uh, we have, uh, let's see, openings. Uh, selectmen for three years. Is there anybody running for selectmen here? John is. He's not here. OK, and John's good. Assessor for three years, one assessor. Is anybody here running and want to speak? He's running, but he ain't going to speak. All right. <laughs> Two members of the Board of Health for three years. Are any of you here want to talk? Tough crowd. Two members of the local school committee for three years. Anybody here want to talk? Hey, Bill, are you running this year? Yeah, but it seems like this tradition's about to die, and that's okay, yeah. so. Um, well, you should stand up for All right, all right. Do I know what to say? Who are you? Introduce yourself uh -huh. and. Uh, Time them. Time them. <laughs> yeah, I got it. That was, that was, that was pretty funny. Two minutes, go. Um, Phil Kenner, River Street, I don't know what's this, my, this would be my third go on, but my daughter's in school there for two more years, so this would be it for me. Uh, uh, I'm on, actually, I'm, I'm the only one that's on the Frontier and the Conway Grammar School. You know, the Conway Grammar School is representative to the Frontier, so I get to do both. So I'm on the budget committees. So at this point, I've like I've acquired institutional knowledge uh, that is actually so that's why I'm sticking around a little bit longer. Um, so, uh, but if anybody wants to oppose me, you're welcome to this spot. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. Record. 48 yeah. seconds. All right. Anybody else local school committee? No? Uh, planning board, uh, two members for three years. Joe? I'm running. I'm not going to campaign. I just want to say that Dave's leaving. He's been a hell of a guy to work with. He's been on the waste and the planning board and the board of health and the emergency management director. And we have an opening. So I'm campaigning for another board member for the planning board. Thanks. Tree warden for three years. I didn't think it would be a fight. <laughs> And one moderator for one year. Okay. Listen. It's nice we do this. I'm going to give all the credit to Mary and Ruth for thinking of this. And I'm saying that because, believe it or not, Deerfield, a much smarter, more sophisticated town, has started doing this very same thing. What a good idea. I can't understand it. So what do you think ever? But look, you're all here, we're all here, because we care. And sometimes I know we get under each other's skin, but you know what? You should be able to speak freely, and you should always remember that. You can say what you want to, there's nothing that's going to happen to you for saying what you mean. You know, if people don't like it, well, that's just, you know, that's like getting poison ivy. you got to deal with the rat. But you're, you are free, and we're still in a place where we can do that, and we should hold on to that for as long as we can, because it's a special thing. Jim Moore, you're making faces. If I could just mention what I had said to you earlier. Um, because we're coming up to 250, and some of you are newer in town, and some of you have been around for a long, long time, and as Jim said to start with, uh, some of us are older and remember stuff. But when I came to town, Pumpkin Hollow was Pumpkin Hollow Road. Now, I don't know whose idea it was or when it came up or anything, but I, it, it became Whateley Road. And Whateley Road should begin at the end of the little common where Whateley Road begins. And I propose at least for our 250th, and I've already made the signs for it, uh, <laughs> that we return to that. But it, it may take a town vote, I don't know. But that should be Pumpkin Hollow Road. It's the original town center. It's original and, common. Oh, Ron Hines. Yes. Uh, I always call it. I, I, I 
I'd like to argue that point because I've lived in town for 67 years and it's always been the Whitney Road. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. 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 Pumpkin Hollow is just the Pumpkin area. Hollow Road. I never that thought area controversy would be the end of this. Joe Sikowski. I just want to make, I want to agree with Ron. We went, I was on the board when we clarified or tried to clarify all the needs. We have all these places like Burkeville and, yeah. and everybody on Baptist Hill wanted to live on Baptist Hill Road. And we, we can't have five roads all named Baptist Hill. You know, we, it cost the neighbors $800 to change it to Upper Baptist Hill. <laughs> we already done. So I, I agree with him. There's all these places in town, but they're not necessarily roads. Park yeah. Howell's a place. Well, I'm making roads. signs for places, too. <laughs> but well, anyway, anyway I, I, I'm going to petition the select board to let me put up a sign there that says, Pumpkin Hollow Original Town Center. <laughs> Bob Hollow. Baker, the good and 1967, <laughs> 1967 or 200, they petitioned the town of County to change Maple Street to Hillview Street. It got passed, they changed the signs, and a very short few years later, it went back to Maple Street. <laughs> Bob, what road do you live on? I don't. You don't? I have a private drive. It used to be Reed's Bridge Road, then it was right. Elm Street, then back to Reed's Bridge, right. and Elm Street's gone back and forth like every six times. It's a fluid situation. You know, if nothing else, you know, Jim, if nothing else, maybe it, you can convince Ron or somebody to put up a sign that says, Pumpkin Hollow, this way. He made him out of it. Yeah, I made the sign already. They're done. Everyone gets their own road. Barry McClintock. Dave just said, she's going to say, take food home. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, she is. You're right. Um, thank you, thank you. And um, there is a lot. there are a lot of great desserts left. I hope you've eaten the one on the, in your bowls. But definitely, the food all goes away. And there's still more. Are we are going to do another topic, or will we? We're done. We're at 831. Or 825 for you. That's okay. Hey, what's your pleasure? You run this thing, I don't. I agree. I agree. Somebody's got a show to watch. Yes, yeah. uh, last, last speaker, Bob, it's about the 250th. Good. We all know the next month, about uh, 250 is coming up. Watch for your correspondence coming in the mail, I believe, sometime this next month. They've got a great weekend plan. The committee, they got a big 250th committee. They've worked really, really hard. Many, many weeks, many, many hours. And they are, they've done a great job, I think. A lot of things are free. Everything, I guess, is free, except for the food and drink you're gonna eat. But uh, they put, they got a whole bunch of plays coming up that are going to be over to the Sportsman's Club that are all free. All you got to do is sign up. This will be explained to you how you sign up to get, get a seat over there. And the whole weekend's planned from, where's Kate French? She's <coughs> Thursday. 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 Roughly from the Covered Bridge to the Common and Pumpkin Hall. All along the streets, uh, there's going to be a great art museum, uh, art display of Lester Stevens is paintings in the Tom Hall in the library. Right, right uh, there on the Phil's wall. Got that going on. Right there. Uh, it's going to get, I guess, recognition quite across the country for it, from what I understand. Uh, so there's many, many things going to go on. We're going to have our fireworks on our leech field <laughs> <laughs> on Friday night. So come to town to see that. 9:30 Friday night on the 16th. They got 1,100 shots of fireworks. They're all going to be shot in the air between three and 400 feet. So you'll be able to sit anywhere in the center county. You'll be able to sit anywhere in the center county and pretty much watch the fireworks. So that's what's happening. Shady is that festivities from 10 to 10 on the ball field and commons. Maybe we've got some bunch of stuff going to happen down here at the grammar school. Uh, they're going to have a horse and. Some kind of displays at Boyden's Field over here. They got antique cars or classic cars over here in the, in the grammar school. They've got tons of stuff going on. So watch the brochure that's going to be coming out. It's going to explain times, 
the days and what's available for you to see. And, it, and it's a time we should all be very proud of right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget the vote and don't forget to go to town.